Hello, and thank you for joining me today. I'm Julie Lafford, Executive Director of Alumni Engagement at York University, and I'm joining you from my home office. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you out there in the audience, whether this is your first Scholars Hub at Home event, or you and you've been joining us from, or you've been joining us from week to week. Thank you, and welcome to this week's event. This webinar is part of our Scholars Hub Speaker Series, which features educational lectures by academics and researchers from York. These lectures are one of the many ways York engages with our nearby communities and invites alumni, students, and the public to participate in meaningful talks and discussions. So we're very pleased to be able to bring this series online to allow even more alumni to hear from some of the university's leading scholars. I do want to provide a short update on some of the ways York is responding to COVID-19 and supporting our students. Recently, President Rhonda Lenton announced that after consulting with government and public health authorities, as well as Senate executive, our fall 2020 term will be delivered for the most part online and remotely. We're committed to ensuring students are able to access the courses that they need to progress in their programs. So we're pleased to share that York will be offering our full selection of academic programming this fall. With our country, province and city beginning to open up, we at York are actively developing a comprehensive academic and operational plan that will support an orderly and phased return to more fulsome operations on our campuses. The university reentry plan will be guided by all the necessary health and safety precautions provided by public health and activated when it is clear it is safe to do so. Although we aren't all in the same location right now, I'd still like to acknowledge that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you all again for joining us remotely. Before we begin, I want to take a quick poll asking, um, it should pop up at any moment on your screen, have you ever attended a York event other than this one right now? Uh, I'll give you each a moment to respond and please do take the time to do that. Thank you so much for participating in that poll. Um, it's great to have so many participants here today um, and we should have results um, from that poll right now. 49% uh, have attended a York event before. Thank you for coming back. And 51% uh, haven't, so welcome. I'm so glad that you're here with us. Um, I know some of you may be new to online events, so if at any time you need help with this experience, feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen enter your question and our team is ready to help you with anything that you need. The same button can be used to submit questions for our speaker for the Q&A period following the talk. So today's talk is titled Loneliness and COVID-19, You, Me and the Virus that Changed Our Lives, featuring, featuring Dr. Ami Rokash in the Department of Psychology in the Faculty of Health at York University. Today's session will be just a little bit longer than past uh, Scholars Hub at Home with a 25 minute presentation followed by a brief Q&A period. And we should be wrapped up um, around 20 to one. So please do stick with us uh, for that period. Ami Rokash, uh, PhD, has been a member of York's psychology department since 1989. His main area of research and interest is loneliness on which he has been conducting research for the past 40 years. He's a clinical psychologist and the executive editor of the journal of psychology, Interdisciplinary and Applied. Dr. Rokash is the author of Loneliness, Love and All That's Between, a psychological look at what makes us lonely, the book, What Keeps Us in Love, and the Psycholo psychological journey to and from loneliness. Welcome, Dr. Rokash. It's a pleasure having you join us today. Good afternoon. I'm really glad to be here. We're, we're pleased to have you. I'm going to turn over to you now for your lecture, and um, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I just wanted to let you know that usually uh, my presentation is about an hour. I was asked to package it into 25 minutes. So I'll do my best to cover as much as I can and hoping 
during the process not to bore you. I want to start with belonging and highlight the importance of belonging. And I want to read to you something that was written by Dean Ornish, who is a cardiologist and a pioneer in cardiology, who wrote a book in 1998 about the importance of relationships. And when a cardiologist, a medical man, writes about connections and emotions, we listen. And he writes, our survival depends on the healing power of love, intimacy, and relationships, physically, emotionally, spiritually, as individuals, as communities, as a culture, perhaps even as a species, which highlights the immense importance of being part of a community, of belonging. However, uh, loneliness, as painful as it is, and I will talk about it, is really a, a blessing in disguise. Loneliness is like uh, physical pain, which is unpleasant and we don't like it, but comes to warn us, something is not right, pay attention. The same thing about loneliness. When we watch uh, National Geographic and we see the herd running, the the a deer that lags behind and stays away from the herd is usually uh, served as lunch to the lions. So loneliness is really a wake-up call and um, we are fortunate that we can experience it. When we talk about loneliness in general, uh, people think about loneliness means being alone being separated from others. And yes, we can uh, experience and, and pay attention, I'm not saying feel, and I'll explain it later, we can experience loneliness when we're alone. But even more painful loneliness is when we're in a crowd, on the bus, on the subway, in the university, or even surrounded by a loving family. When we still feel unconnected, we will experience loneliness. The most painful loneliness is in an intimate relationship where uh, we're supposed to be connected very well to our best friend and we still feel disconnected, um, almost alienated from the person who is supposed to be closest to us. When we talk about loneliness, I would like to differentiate reactive versus essential loneliness. Reactive loneliness is loneliness that we experience as a reaction to some significant loss or change that happened in our world. For instance, losing someone that we love, uh, being fired from our work, going on retirement. Some people feel lonely for that. Feel, experience loneliness because of that. Essential loneliness is loneliness that is not related necessarily to the here and now, but mostly is loneliness that is intertwined in the person's personality. And that dates back to his or her beginning days. And it's something that uh, we cannot deal with in a very quick manner that usually requires long-term psychotherapy. So we talked about loneliness and it's time to ask, what is loneliness? Loneliness is a condition which is uh, shared by everyone, but actually we all experience it subjectively different. It is uh, an experience that involves feelings and thoughts can touch our spiritual being and um, no one likes to be or experience loneliness. Loneliness, um, th there were uh, suggestions that loneliness is really a subjective experience, meaning that uh, while we all talk about loneliness as if it were the same thing, actually it's not. And we each experience it somewhat differently. The last characteristic of loneliness is that it is always very painful. It is highly distressing. 
And later on, I'll talk about what it actually does to our body and our psyche. When I started the study of loneliness uh, 40 years ago, I wanted to know what exists in the literature. And I categorized the various theoretical approaches into three major categories. The first one I called social. If you look at our world, this day and age, you will see that we can survive with very little interaction with other people. I look at the uh, hallways in the university. The newer ones are different, but the older ones are narrow hallways with no um, uh, chairs or any place where students or students and faculty could congregate. Uh, people are just moving back and forth and uh, it, it gives a feeling of alienation. I, I step back sometimes and I look at it, and that, by the way, motivated me to decide that no matter which class I'm teaching, even large classes of two, three hundred students, I'm going to make sure that the first meeting, we're going to get to know each other. And I devote almost the entire uh, meeting to, to students getting to know each other. So when they come the following week, they're not so disconnected and alienated from each other. Apartment buildings are built the same way. We used to need to go to the bank. Now we can do everything by the computer. So there is a suggestion that our uh, era enhances loneliness. And, and there are uh, pro and con uh, arguments, which I won't get into it now because we don't have enough time. The second approach is the psychiatric approach, which I vehemently uh, disagree with. And it says, if you are lonely and your loneliness is very deep, that is akin to a psychological disturbance and you need treatment. I subscribe to the existential approach which says that being able to experience loneliness is very similar to being able to experience joy and hope and anger. And it's, a, it's an integral part of being human. My minor contribution to the literature was to suggest that uh, although it's, it's part of our existence, I see loneliness as a recessive or non-dominant gene that is fully experienced are the, under the right circumstances. And that of course doesn't apply to the people that I talked about before where there is essential loneliness there. There, there is loneliness all the time. And I've seen some couples, for instance, where they came in and, and they said, we really love each other. And the husband in that case said, well, I do everything for my wife and I'm so close to her. And she says, I still feel alone and lonely and isolated and lost. And it's quite clear after I explored the relationship that it's not because of the relationship. It is something that she brought with her. I want to talk about uh, several concepts that are related to loneliness, and then we can talk about uh, loneliness and COVID. The stigma. Loneliness has a very serious stigma attached to it, which interestingly enough is, is not uh, working now, is not attached to loneliness. And that's the reason that so many people now in the COVID era talk about loneliness. The stigma goes something like that. Ours is a couple culture. Our culture adores success. If I am lonely, that means that no one wants to be with me. If no one wants to be with me, that probably is because I'm no good. If I'm no good, I will probably be seen as a loser. And as such, I'm not going to go around and look for friends because other people are not going to go, uh, are not going to want to be with me for fear that they will be losers as well. So there are millions and millions of people walking around feeling disconnected and lonely and they won't talk about it. Theresa May in, in uh, the UK 
did something amazing two years ago by appointing a minister for loneliness affairs. And that suddenly uh, indicated to people around the world, it is okay now to talk about loneliness and even to admit it. Now, when we have the COVID, people openly talk about it because there is no stigma attached. Now I can present it, well, because of the lockdown, I am lonely, but um, it's not because of my doing, which takes the stigma away. Later on, when I talk about COVID, I will indicate uh, who's really uh, amenable to loneliness during this era and who I think will continue to be lonely even after we finish with it. And I think that I wanted to uh, mention is loneliness anxiety. Uh, loneliness anxiety is the anxiety that some people may feel uh, after they have been lonely and suffered the pain of loneliness. And the best example that I can give to explain it is if we look at people who survived the Holocaust and experienced hunger, which hopefully you and I will never know. And that hunger was so horrible that even after the war was over and they came to the Western world and they have whatever they need, they're still always worried about being without enough food. And those people uh, were found to hoard food incredibly. And um, th there are some stories about Holocaust survivors that after they died, there was green bread filled with mold, which was found under their beds. They were so terrified of uh, hunger. The same thing with people who have loneliness anxiety. They do not wait until they become lonely, but they do whatever they can to calm down their anxiety about loneliness. Two more uh, concepts that I would like to speak about, and one of them is solitude. Solitude is a wonderful word that we have in English, which I am not sure is uh, present in other languages. I inquired, and the few languages that I inquired about, it doesn't exist. Solitude is a situation where we are geographically alone because we chose to be alone to do what can be done only alone, to think and to reflect and to pray and to take a walk in the woods and to meditate and to create many uh, great literary creations uh, were done when the author was in solitude. So solitude is a wonderful experience, which is really recharging. It allows us to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life and just get some peace and quiet. What does loneliness do to us? We talk about it being very painful. Yes, it is. But what else uh, can we say about loneliness? So first of all, physically, it is connected to a lowered immune uh, system, just like stress and loneliness is stressful. Stress de depresses the immune system. So it's connected to sleep disturbances. It connects to hypertension. It connects to uh, either us becoming more susceptible to illnesses or when we become sick, uh, we are slower to bounce back. And uh, I say now to people who I speak with, you know, the more you're afraid of the virus, the, the, some people are panicky, the higher your chances to contract it. Um, it also, it also um, quite significantly affects our emotional well-being. Um, people experienced low self-esteem they uh, think that they are unlovable and unwanted. Um, it, it is even for older people uh, associated with dementia, which is quite severe. And 
apparently loneliness can predict mortality. People who are not lonely um, have a chance to have to live not only a better life, but a longer one. So research asked people who are lonely, how does it feel to be lonely? Tell us what you say, what, what you feel and what you experience. And people talked about feeling unwanted and unloved and rejected, sad and depressed and seeing themselves, as I mentioned before, as unattractive and um, as worthless. And part of the problem with loneliness is if it goes for too long, and I will talk about how to deal with it later on, we start to become desperate and even hopeless. One of the problems with people who have been lonely for a long time is that they are less willing to take social risks. What's a social risk? When I approach someone that I don't know very well and I start a conversation, that's a social risk. That person could say to me, you know what, I'm not interested in talking with you. Or even if I speak with someone who I do know, if the discussion doesn't seem to roll and go well, I can say to myself, oh my God, maybe he's not interested in me. Approaching other people, interacting with other people is a social risk. And most of us, most of us can take it to some extent, smaller or larger. People who have been lonely for a long time will take less of those risks. They also, as time goes on, become angry and upset that they're lonely and forgotten by the world, and they find it more difficult to display friendly behavior, which unfortunately drives other people away from them even faster. And I think that we noticed about uh, lonely people is that they adopt a passive approach to coping with stress in general and with loneliness in particular, kind of saying, well, what can I do? I'm lonely, I tried before, it doesn't work, I'll just continue. One of the things that I noticed, especially with the elderly who may be lonely, is they are becoming demanding and critical, bitter. Unfortunately, those same things will drive away other people from them. And that is something that uh, they need to be aware of. So here we are in the COVID-19 era where people, many people, complain of social isolation and loneliness. Personally, I think that uh, the COVID is really a blessing. I believe that our world, our globe, is getting a reminder, stop the running, stop the pollution, notice your friends and notice your um, fellow men and um, work on your relationship. So people find it uh, very easy to, to claim, well, I'm lonely because of the lockdown and I can't take it anymore. As I mentioned before, when I differentiated between reactive and essential loneliness is that I believe that those who are essentially lonely are very lonely now and will continue to be lonely when they come out. My hope is that when we come out of this period of physical uh, distance, not social distance, I think it's a misnomer, we'll, we'll be much more appreciative of what it is to have friends and to have family and to be able to get close to people and to touch their hand and to give them a hug. I think that all of us are missing close contact with people, but missing close contact doesn't necessarily mean that we're lonely. We could be lonely, but many times we can also just miss uh, going to visit other people. 
even though um, I, I live in, in a suburb of Toronto with a lot of uh, small houses. And I would take a walk outside every day and go by two or three of my neighbors, knock on their doors and through the glass door, talk to them and find out if they need something and kept my relationship, even though I had to talk from outside of their home. Uh, I also suspect that when people talk about loneliness, they don't necessarily mean loneliness, but they may be talking about boredom, anxiety, feeling that they lack control of the situation. They were told to stay home and there's nothing they can do. And I think that all of it gets put together into the word loneliness. Additionally, I think that uh, there is really no stigma in being lonely now. Actually, it makes me part of the community. Like everyone else, I am lonely. So it's okay to go out and scream to whoever is ready to hear us, I am lonely. I miss my grandchildren, I miss my children, etc. I also think that there is uh, what I call media IV. We uh, get uh, almost like an intravenous um, doses of media on a daily basis. And the thing that the media deals with is the COVID and loneliness. And that seems to affect some people. So the question is, okay, how do we approach it? And what do we do? And there are so many permutations. I'm not going to talk about people who are old and who are ill. I am not going to be talking about people who live alone versus people who live together. These are all permutations that we simply don't have time to talk about. But I want to talk about the first thing that I do with people who come and consult with me about loneliness. What should I do? Um, Martin Seligman, who was, is an American psychologist, talked about learned helplessness. That is when we learn that we cannot get out of a situation and we remain helpless. And I will share a, a short story to illustrate it. There was uh, an Indian man in India who received a small elephant as a present. And uh, he would have to go and tend his farms every day. So he tied the elephant into a wooden pole. And the small elephant, of course, didn't like it and tried to free himself from it and was unsuccessful. And of course, every day when the uh, farmer came back, he was really happy to see him. But he was tied to the pole. Along the years, the elephant grew up and became very powerful. And with one yank, could take out the pole. However, he learned that he couldn't cope with the pole. The pole was stronger than him and he remained there. Many of us developed that kind of approach while we live our lives. And um, there are situations now when we arrive, loneliness or no loneliness, when we arrive at them and we stand there and we say, nah, I can't do anything about it. I never did and I just can't. So what can we do about, about loneliness? If we can learn not to be uh, helpless. The, fact, the, the first, the first uh, point, the first strategy is to stop our madly run and to reflect on our situation. And even though we don't like to do that, say, yep, I'm lonely. It doesn't feel good. I suffer, but I'm lonely. And then accept it. You cannot fight and deny who you are. And it's, it's, it's so important to stop and accept it. The second thing is, and I have done it myself, where um, I chose... I took control over the situation and chose rather than complain and be sad and feel helpless in a situation which engulfs the whole globe, I'm going to turn it into solitude. 
and I will do things that I can do while I'm alone and enjoy it. And for the last two and a half months, there was not one day that the lockdown caused me suffering. I encourage people as an additional strategy to see the half full cup. Yes, it would be much nicer to be able to go, to go to restaurants, to go and visit people. However, we need to remember that it's a temporary situation. We are starting to come out of it. And maybe life is not gonna be exactly the same way it was, but it's gonna go back to similar to what it was. So seeing it as just a temporary situation is gonna be very helpful. We can engage socially. Now we are allowed to do that. But we could do that, as, as I gave you an example before, uh, before that, but uh, with precautions. Now we can go and visit other people and maybe not going to their homes, but the weather is nice. We could go into their backyards. We could stand in their front yards and keep six feet away and talk and really relate. The most important thing before I'm finishing, I'm aware of the time, is we can enhance emotional intimacy even without physical contact. And a lot of what I found myself doing, and <clears throat> I think everyone can do, is while you just think, if that happened 30 years ago before we had computers and Skype and Zoom, we would be in trouble you can connect with other people and you can deepen the intimacy by not talking about just how was it to, to go shopping or what is going to be the next vacation. But people can start to talk about what's really important for them. And you may be surprised if you haven't tried it yet that you can build a really intimate relationship even through Skype. Um, two more points and then I will stop even though I could continue and talk for quite a while. Uh, religion and faith seem to help people. Um, my research indicated that these two are separate. People find solace in, in going and praying with the community in a church, in a, in a mosque, in a, in a synagogue, being together with other people all of the same faith is quite comforting. And I believe that's one of the uh, reasons that religion was created. Faith is different. Uh, you don't have to uh, go to a, a place of worship to have faith and to connect with the power to be, the higher power uh, by yourself. And these two things in general help people feel connected. And the last thing is growth that may happen as a result of loneliness. We can grow. We can find resources that we didn't know we have. We can develop ourselves and see that no matter what the challenge is, we can overcome it. I'll stop here. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer if I know the answer. Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Rokash. Really appreciate it. I think it's it's very, very timely and um, gives a lot for all of us to reflect on. And I agree, the better weather and the ability to see live humans is is pretty tremendous. It's uh, I can't wait to be able to like give somebody a hug. Um, so now over to the questions from the audience. Uh, we do have a few minutes uh, for that. So Beverly Biderman asks, are there advantages of loneliness if it's not severe? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's similar to the advantages of pain if it's not severe. Pain tells me that I'm still here, that I'm still alive, only that people don't feel pain. If I'm lonely, that tells me various things. One, it tells me that I'm in touch with myself. 
and that um, it probably indicates that either I don't have enough relationships or the ones that I have are not satisfactory. And it's a reminder, hey, do something about it. So yes. Thank you for that. I was wondering, oh, actually I have another question from the audience. I won't, I won't take advantage of being the moderator and just ask all my questions. Um, my colleague Janine asks, can you speak to the differences between loneliness, anxiety, and depression? Okay. Uh, it seems that those three are probably what people feel right now. Anxiety usually comes from our perception that we cannot handle the situation, that we don't have the resources or we cannot uh, control or predict where the situation goes. People many times confuse um, or see uh, depression and loneliness together, saying, oh yeah, when I'm lonely for a long time, I become depressed. So we looked at it. And uh, apparently these are two different concepts and we know it by looking at the way people react when they are depressed versus lonely. When we're depressed, all we want is to be left alone. We kind of say, just leave me alone. I need time for myself. Whereas when we're lonely, we want other people. We want meaningful relationships. So you can be lonely and depressed, depression doesn't necessarily require loneliness as a prerequisite. Thank you for that. I have another question from Gaudi Prager. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is the loneliness sometimes caused by a longing for something or someone else? Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, when we are um, in a situation where we don't have someone close to us or when we are, I mentioned before, into a relationship. And if those relationships are uh, not fulfilling, uh, not intimate in that we are not emotionally close, I'm not talking about sexually, the result is loneliness. And that's actually the most painful loneliness that we can experience because we are in a relationship that is supposed to protect us from that loneliness. And actually, it enhances it. Thank you. Eleni, oh, I'm not even going to try your last name, Eleni, I'm sorry, um, says, hello, Dr. Ami. Thank you for this wonderful talk. My question is, can we substitute intimate loneliness from a partner with social connection and still feel at peace? Well, well, well. intimate loneliness uh, from a partner. Okay, maybe loneliness that comes out of the uh, uh, unsatisfactory intimacy that's what you are yeah it's it, it, exactly it's can we substitute um intimate loneliness from a partner with social connection and still feel at peace so is that intimate see with a partner necessary is what i'm reading that as that's an interesting question and the answer is yes and no which is always the safest response um, no, because if you, and, and most of us yearn for intimacy in, in a close relationship, if you really need that, I think that also relates to the previous question. If you uh, really need it, then nothing is going to be able to uh, replace it unless if you are in a relationship and you take a lover. But we're not talking about that. Now, that's the part of no. It cannot really be replaced. It can be replaced if you decide that you don't need your intimate relationship and the intimacy, the closeness, if you don't need it to survive. And uh, if you can really convince yourself of that, and that's, that's going to be not easy, then you can say, okay, I don't need that and I will have intimacy and closeness with other people in, in the community. So that's the yes. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Ali asks, how can you start the conversation to assist elder elderly relatives who have built up a wall due to loneliness? What are some tips to get them to open up? I know this isn't something you touched on a whole lot, but it's, it's right. important right now. It's really, a, <clears throat> it's really a complex 
question because there are many things that uh, I don't know about, about what she, she means. I don't know if that's somebody she knows or if she's a volunteer coming to someone's home and saying, okay, I'm gonna help them. There, there are many unknowns. But what I have learned in my work with the elderly is that you can't come and say, oh, you're lonely, let's talk about it. Because they will immediately say, no, I'm not lonely and I don't need any help. I, I think that if, if she is a psychology graduate, she may have learned along the years how to start a conversation with a person without necessarily asking the question, are you lonely? Let's talk about it. We can talk about all kinds of stuff. And in psychology, we have a rule of thumb, which says people will always talk about what's really important for them. So if that elderly is lonely, eventually, once I can convince that person that it's safe to open up a bit, he or she will talk about loneliness, and then we can address it. I can Sorry, no, my fault. I muted myself and then forgot I muted myself. So I have another question from the audience. Um, Gail Taylor asks, can you say more about how we can grow in periods of loneliness that can be turned into solitude? Okay, uh, these are really two questions in one. Uh, I'll start with with one of them, and that is how can we turn loneliness into solitude? That has a lot to do with how we structure the situation, how we see it, and how we go about it. So I can sit and say, oh, wow, I really feel lonely, or I, I really experience loneliness. Um, and, and I want to differentiate, as I did before, we can miss other people. We are wired, as I, as I started in the beginning by saying, we're wired to be with people. But if we're not with people, it doesn't need to, to be lonely. So I can say to myself, I really miss being with people. But until then, I'm going to do two things. I will figure out why I can't be with people. And sometimes there are external circumstances, sometimes there are internal circumstances. And the second thing, I will decide that until I am with people and working on getting close to people, I will be in solitude, which means that I will uh, reframe the situation as, as we uh, see it in psychology, not as one where I am dying to be with other people and I can, but rather as a time that I will do what I want to do by myself, all along working and trying to understand why can't I get to people? Why do I experience loneliness? And once I understand it, I can work on it and still be in solitude. Now, even when I'm in solitude, I can miss other people. I mean, it, it, it's like, it's like um, uh, going on a diet where we restrict our food intake and we miss food. But that doesn't mean that we're crazily hungry. It means that we miss food. Uh, there, oh, uh, how can we grow? That was the second part of, of the question. How can we grow? from loneliness. That is exactly what I hope will happen to humankind as a, as, as a reaction to the COVID. We see that when we are forced uh, into a lockdown, we don't miss our boats and we don't miss our new cars, we miss human interaction. And that's really an important thing for all of us to realize. I like to be with other people. I like to interact with other people. I need to interact with other people. And while I will find resources within myself 
to go over this period and to overcome any uh, uh, shreds of loneliness, I also want to see what can I do and how can I live my life better not to advance in my position and not to acquire more material, but how can I live life more meaningfully once we are all allowed out? Thank you. That was, that was very profound. Um, that is all the time we have for today. So I'm sorry, there were questions we didn't get to, but thank you again, Dr. Rakash. This was, this was great. It was, I'm glad we took the extra time with you. So My thank pleasure. You and thanks for giving me the, the extra time. <laughs> Our pleasure entirely. Um, so before I say goodbye to the audience, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to join us today. And I have one last poll for you before you go. This question really helps inform our events moving forward. Um, so it should appear on your screen shortly. Would you recommend this event to a friend? Please take a moment and answer that. Oh, for so sure. <laughs> I love your answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thanks for participating in the poll, everyone, Dr. Rokash, um, and for joining us um, for Scholars Hub at Home series. If you have feedback about this uh, event or any other programming, um, it's very welcome. Please send it along to us at alumni at yorku.ca. And feel free to share this talk with your friends. It will be posted either Facebook page or our YouTube page, which you should um, follow for sure. Our next Scholars Hub at Home lecture is taking place live next Wednesday, May 27th at noon. A professor, it's featuring Professor Stephen Hoffman, who will be speaking about Canada, Canada's response to COVID-19. Dr. Hoffman has been all over the media um, advising um, on, on this very topic, and it should be a really interesting one, especially as we really enter a new phase of this lockdown. So thanks again for attending the event, and I, as always, I wish you all continued health and well-being during this time. Be well.